All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our continuing education class today. My name is Paul Croto, and I am beyond excited today to uh, introduce to you our guest speaker for our, this Thursday. He is um, the best, the best there is. And um, I, I met him uh, seven or eight years ago. And uh, so I, I just got the phone with him a little while ago this morning. We were talking about the call today. And uh, I told him that we make the Divine Magnificence uh, CD uh, mandatory here in the coaching program. And uh, he was all flustered over that in that uh, he's like, oh, that was made so long ago, you know, so we need something updated. So today we're going to do a little bit of an updated version of that. And so those of you that don't know Ben or, or um, you know, if you're new, new to longevity and you're just uh, getting to meet Ben for the first time today, you're in for a real treat. So I'm not going to give away Ben's whole story, but he is a, uh, a former pharmacist, which is the perfect person in the world to come on and talk to us, you know, and, and really embrace Dr. Wallach's message um, and, and, and has seen, you know, or saw so many people come and get prescriptions and what it was doing to them. And I'm, um, Ben, if you could, during your story today, to go in, go into that where, you know, what were some of the things you're seeing from people taking these prescriptions? And it's not just people taking one or two prescriptions. These days, they're just taking, you know, multitude, you know, six, seven, eight different prescriptions, which is absolute insanity. And they're not, you know, looking for that root cause. And what I love about Ben, same thing I love about Doc is that he's a guy that always looks for the root cause. What is causing this? What is the fundamental um, underlining um, cause for this health problem or all health problems for that matter. And he just makes things so easy to understand. So I, I love hearing from him. So I'm going to do as little talking as possible today and uh, turn the time over to Ben. And what will happen is while Ben is talking, um, if you have a question, please put it in, in the, uh, in the chat area here, Becca is going to be co uh, collecting those, uh, co uh, those questions. And then Becca will be answering um, or asking Ben some questions at the end of the call from the uh, the post made in the comments section. So without further ado, let's bring on Ben. And, and Ben, I we all are dying to hear your story. And um, and we're all health coaches here and, and help looking to help other people like you are and, uh, and, and be just like you, Ben. Uh, well, I don't know if you want to be just like me, Paul, but I appreciate the kind words and I appreciate you. You know, you I remember when you started and to watch this last seven years, to watch your how uh, physically fit you've gotten over the last seven years and how dedicated you are to spreading the message. And everybody who's working under you should know that uh, you got a, a, real, a real prince at the top of your line there who's helping you out. So thank you so much for doing that, Paul. Appreciate and thank that. You to, and thank you to my princess who helps me out, Rebecca. I appreciate everything you're doing too, Rebecca. So thank you for that. And uh, here's the deal. I, first of all, I'm still a pharmacist. I'm a registered pharmacist, but I never liked drugs. I never liked the concept of drugs. Never liked, I never liked the idea that you could somehow get better by taking a drug. That didn't fly with me because in pharmacy school, we study, we spend a lot of time studying. In fact, I would venture to say we spend most of our, our time studying the toxicity of drugs, side effects and adverse reactions and uh, patient compliance and the association of drugs to disease states. So I'm learning about the poisonous nature of drugs in pharmacy school. And I'm thinking to myself, this something doesn't sound right here. How is it that these things are so toxic, but yet we're using them for healing? So in my 19, uh, you know, 20 year old kind of brain, always questioning authority anyway, that tends to be my nature, I smelt a rat. And then to compound things, um, in pharmacy school, we actually study nutrition except we don't study nutrition like a nutritionist studies nutrition. We don't study nutrition like a dietitian studies nutritionist. We don't even study nutrition like a doctor studies nutrition. We study nutrition like a pharmacist would study nutrition, which means we study the pharmaceutical properties, the therapeutic properties, the medicinal properties of vitamins and minerals and essential fatty acids and essential amino acids. We study the therapeutic properties of what we now today call the mighty 90 essential nutrients. And on top of that, we study the relationship of diseases to deficiencies. 
in the mighty, mighty 90 essential nutrients. We study arthritis as a deficiency in, in essential fatty acids or heart disease as the manifestation of a deficiency in B vitamins or vitamin C or uh, 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 GI problems as an issue with the microbiome. We study the relationship of new, what are called nutrients to uh, to disease state, deficiencies in nutrients to disease states, and we study the relationship of nutrients to, to good health and their therapeutic properties. So on the one hand, I'm learning about drugs as poisons. On the other hand, I'm learning at, about nutrients as, heal, as healing elements. So I'm sitting here, I already smelt a rat in pharmacy school. I'm thinking to myself, I think maybe we want to explore this nutritional idea a little bit more. And on top of all of that, I was a bodybuilder and a weightlifter and an athlete. And when you're a bodybuilder and a weightlifter and an athlete and you're in your 20s, the one thing you care about in life is being big. As some, as some of the guys out there, I don't know if the ladies can relate to this, but to the guys, it was all about getting big. We admired, uh, back then, this is how old I am, we liked Lou Ferrigno and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. And these were the guys who were in the muscle magazines. And guess what? They were doing whey protein. They were doing creatine. They were doing amino acids. They were doing essential fatty acids. And they were writing about it. They were telling you how to dose with it. And, and I was, that was my thing. And so I started to get involved with taking nutrition personally. So I'm learning about drugs as poisons. I'm learning about nutrients as medicines. I'm learning about diseases as nutritional deficiencies. I'm learning about the, personally about the effects of nutrition for getting big and strong. So it's finally something just clicked. And I thought to myself, well, there's, there's really got to be something, something here. So I got, when I got out of pharmacy school, I had this idea that there's something powerful about nutrition and there's something about nutritional deficiencies that not make, not making us healthy or, or not impairing our health, not uh, allowing us to maximize or optimize our good health. And so uh, in pharmacy, I, my first job was, and people will laugh because a lot of people heard this story already, but it's, it's still a funny story. Uh, and Rebecca's smiling over there. You know what I'm going to say, right? So I, I, my first job was at Kmart of all things, right? And I'd always worked in the lab. My background was in, lab, in dermatology in the lab. So I never really worked in drugstores. And so my first job was at Kmart Pharmacy. And uh, I, was, I was smelling a rat about nutrition or about drugs, and I was really getting hip to nutrition. So when pa patients would come to my pharmacy, I was this you know, young punk kid, and I was telling them, this was the 1980s, I was saying things like, they would come in for, for example, for an antibiotic. I would say, you know, maybe you want some vitamin C with that antibiotic. Or they'd come in for their calcium channel blocker, and I'd be like, uh, maybe you want some magnesium to go with that calcium channel blocker. I started suggesting people take nutrients along with their medications. And keep in mind, this is, we're talking 1986, 1987 here. And nobody, there were not health food stores everywhere. Longevity wasn't going to be born for another 10 years. Dr. Wallach was just traveling around with selling plant-derived minerals. Like, people thought he was crazy. Now, it's like the world of nutrition was for health nuts. How many of you guys remember health nuts? You know, if you're prescribing nutrients, if you're suggesting nutrients, if you were using nutrients, you were a health nut. But if you were suggesting or recommending nutrients and you were a pharmacist, you were really weird, right? People want their drugs. But you know what happened? People were getting better. People were starting to lower their prescription doses. People would heal faster if they were on antibiotics or all of a sudden their acne medicine would work because they were starting to take zinc. And I started to get a reputation for the pharmacist who started to understand about nutrition. And then I started to get really cocky. And when people would come in for their uh, calcium channel blocker or their acne medication, and I wouldn't say, maybe you want to take some zinc with that, uh, with that acne medicine, or maybe you want to take some, uh, some magnesium with that calcium channel blocker. I would say, maybe you want to take some magnesium instead of that calcium channel blocker. And I started telling people to get off their medication. And this was kind of obnoxious, I understand. And, and sure enough, uh, you know, Kmart Pharmacy wasn't exactly thrilled with Pharmacist Ben. And one day, you know, the, the inevitable happened. And uh, I'll never forget Mr. Osher, my, derm, my uh, district manager, he goes, Ben, you're just not cut out to be Kmart material. And I thought that he said it with no irony at all. He didn't under, even, it never even crossed his mind, but I cracked up and I just left. And I, I started my own pharmacy. I started a pharmacy that was dedicated to nutrition and skincare. And uh, the same thing that happened, happened that happened Kmart happened at, uh, and also Albertsons, I was at too, happened in my pharmacy. People got better. People were, got off, hang on. Pe pe are, are, did I lose you guys? People got off their drugs or they at least reduced their drugs. They started to lose weight in addition to having their blood pressure drop. They would, they would have better digest digestion and their skin would improve at the same time. And I saw these incredible transformations that people were making, things that could not happen with prescription drugs and with no side effects and no toxicity 
and stuff that you could just go to the health food store uh, and, and just buy off the shelf that you didn't have to interact with the medical model. So I decided after a couple of years of doing this, I decided I had to tell the whole world about this, that there was this thing that we were sitting on, this power that would allow us to, to address health challenges that the medical model says we have no idea what to do. That, pe that would allow people to really make changes in their health that were transcended anything remotely that a prescription drug can do. And so I started doing little talks. I had a little talk in my, I started doing little talks in my lab and then it got bigger and then it got bigger. And pretty soon at the end of a few years, I had a reputation as being the nutritional pharmacist in, the nutritional pharmacist in Denver. And I was in the gym one day and I was working out and uh, I was lifting weights. My buddy Russ was spotting me. And I, I happened to mention to him that I had been listening to these tapes. I've been getting these tapes in the mail. And I've been listening to these tapes. Of course, these tapes were dead doctors don't lie tapes. And I loved them. I, I was listening to these things and I was like kind of changing my life, changing my perspective. Even though I've already been in nutrition, this guy on the tape, Dr. Wallach, as it turns out, was saying things that I learned in pharmacy school, saying things that I had realized that were accurate from my own personal and professional experience and saying things that I didn't even know about. And so I got addicted and he's saying them in a way that, as you know, if you've heard it, is just like, sounds like Moses on Mount Sinai delivering the 10 commandments. You know, it's like he has this powerful voice and I was just, I was obsessed. I mean, and I listened to these tapes over and over and over again. One day I'm lifting weights in the gym and I say to Russ, hey, I'm listening to these tapes. They're called Dead Doctors Don't Lie. And, and Russ goes, do you mean Dr. Wallach? I know Dr. Wallach. And it turns out that Dr. Wallach had been coming to Denver and Boulder and in, in the Colorado area for a long time. He, come, he had actually had some business connections here. He'd been teaching here and he had a lot of people and longevity had just begun. It was 1998, this was 1998. Longevity had just started, maybe six months, eight months old. And he says to me, yeah, doc comes out here all the time. I'm like, you wanna meet him? I'm like, yes, I wanna meet him. And uh, next thing I know, one day I'm working in my lab and there's Russ and another guy, uh, Bob Snook and, and Dr. Wallach. And, and they came into my lab and me and Dr. Wallach just hit it off. And uh, he did, I, you know, later he found out, but at the time he didn't know I'd been listening to his tapes like a hundred times. So he thought he was talking to himself practically because you know, I, had, I had memorized his tape almost word to word at the, at the time. And then Doc asked me if I wanted to do his radio show when he, he was traveling, so he, wouldn't, he'd have to, he needed a, a guest host for his show. So I started doing the Dead Doctors Don't Lie show, which I still do. And keep in mind, the company at this point has got 300 people in it maybe, 400 people, very tiny little company. And I was 38 at the time, now I'm 60. And for the last 22 years, I've just been spreading the word about the power and importance of a good nutritional supplement program and helping Dr. Wallach in his mission to help educate people about the power of plant-derived minerals and trying to make the, uh, the world a better place by not just understanding nutrition and nutritional supplementation, as those of you guys who know I'm talking, who, um, who listen to me or have listened to me over the years, I like talking about all the dimensions of health and wellness. I don't think disease is just physical. I think it's, uh, I call it the four dimensions of healing, spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, or the four dimensions of health, and they're all important. When we're sick, we're not just sick physically, we're sick emotionally, mentally, and ultimately we're sick spiritually. And without addressing all of these uh, dimensions of health, we can't be maximally healthy. And uh, the classic example of, not, uh, of what happens when you don't address all these levels is what I call the plateau. And that's where people get better right away, but they don't improve after that. You guys know what I'm talking about? If you see somebody who gets better quickly, and that's one of the great gifts about the human body is the more deficient we are, the faster the body absorbs nutrients. Does that make sense? The more, the more deficient we are in the B vitamins, the faster our body sucks up those B vitamins. The, the sicker we are, the faster we turn it around. The more weight we need to lose, the faster the pounds drop off of us. So people will notice dramatic results when they're deficient, when they start taking the Beyond Tangy Tangerine. Dramatic, dramatic. When they start a nutritional supplement program, they'll notice dramatic results. But a lot of times people will plateau. They'll stay the same. You guys know what I'm talking about? I'm sure you have customers like that or clients like that. Rest assured, there are emotional, mental, and spiritual needs that have not been addressed. The only reason I say that is because it's important for all of us in the healthcare business to understand that our patients are not only unhealthy physically, they're unhealthy on all dimensions. And without addressing all dimensions, they're not going to be able to maximize their health. So that's a long-winded answer, Mr. Croto, for a very short question that you asked. But I hope I, I hope that was uh, I hope that was comprehensive. I hope that 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 covered everything that you wanted to hear. Absolutely. You know, that was uh, you, uh, just if you could just dive in a little bit more about you know what you've seen from 
people that were taking drugs and you know that they just weren't getting healthier yeah yeah a couple things i saw first of all they weren't getting better clearly they weren't getting better but even worse they would have to take higher and higher doses or even worse they would have to take other drugs to take care of the side effects of the first drugs and what ended up happening people would be on not just one drug not just two drugs, not just three drugs, but sometimes 10 or 12 or 13 or 14 drugs. And it wasn't un unusual for me to be in the pharmacy and somebody would take a plastic bag with filled with pill bottles, filled with pill bottles, 14 different pill bottles sometimes, and just throw them on my counter and have, have them filled up, uh, have me fill, uh, refill them. And there's no way there, it, with one drug that your body will not be suffering from a toxicity with one drug, let alone with two or three or four or five, a cocktail of drugs. And when they do tox uh, side effect profiles to determine the side effects of a drug, they don't do them with 14 drugs, they do them with one drug. So when you start taking multiple drugs, technically they call that polypharmacy, you are opening up a Pandora's box of potential toxicity, all, check this out, all while not feeling, not, not getting healthier. Not only are you opening up a Pandora's box of disease and, and side effects and adverse reactions, but you're doing it without affecting the original condition, except symptomatically. It is the ultimate tragedy. And I, by the way, you said I wasn't a pharmacist and I, I told you I was a pharmacist. I'm not a pharmacist in the sense that I don't dispense drugs anymore. Right. I'm a pharmacist in the sense that I take my continuing education every two years and I, I still have my pharmacy license, but I couldn't live with myself as a pharmacist because I couldn't do that to people especially kids and old people, and it's the kids and the old people who are getting the most drugs. So I felt, I, I could, I felt guilty. I couldn't live with myself doing that, and that's the reason why I didn't do it. To answer your question with a little more specificity, Paul, the number one issue, the number one issue uh, problem people have when they start on polypharmacy is, and this is, uh, this is a technical diagnosis, they feel like crap, <laughs> okay? They feel lousy. That's what happens when, uh, when they're on a, uh, when they're on polypharmacy, they feel tired, their libido drops, they, can't, they don't heal from wounds, they accelerate the aging process. And this is all under the aegis, under, within the realm of a world where they're going to get better. They're going to get better. If you told them that they were gonna age faster, they're gonna feel like crap, they weren't gonna be able to have sex, they're gonna have more wrinkles, their bones would deteriorate uh, uh, when they took the drug, do you think they would ever take the drug? Of course not. Now, this is where our patients are responsible. Now, when you are sick and you go to a doctor, you don't have to do what the doctor tells you. However, if you do go to the doctor, you owe it to the doctor to tell him what you're doing. And this is really, really important. When you go to a doctor and you don't, you're not uh, uh, you're feeling comfortable with whatever his protocol is, whether it's a prescription drug or whether it's surgery or whatever it is, you don't have to do that, but you owe it to your doctor to tell him that you're not going to do it. Or if you're on a prescription drug, uh, a polypharmacy, you're on prescription medicine, you're on a protocol that your doctor gave you, blood thinners, beta blockers, blood pressure medicine, whatever it is. If you're on a protocol and you decide you're gonna be on a nutritional supplement program and you go see your longevity rep or somebody comes to see you and they say, they say, well, my doctor doesn't want this, my doctor doesn't want that. You don't have to do what your doctor tells you and you as healthcare professionals need to know that. The patient does not have to, doesn't pay the doctor. I'm sorry, the doctor doesn't pay the patient. The patient pays the doctor. The doctor works for the patient. It's not the other way around. However, you have to tell the doctor what you're doing. See, doctors, they don't know a study about nutrition, but they, and they don't even study about drugs, but they have salespeople who are coming in telling them about, about the drugs. There's no vitamin C salesman. There's no zinc salesman. There's no essential fatty acid salesman unless that essential fatty acid has been tweaked and patented by drug, by drug company. So to the doctor, the nutritional supplements represent an unknown quantity. The, to the doctor, the nutritional supplements represent danger. Ironically, to the doctor, the drugs represent the safe choice. Why? Because that's what they're being sold and they're being controlled by, uh, they're being uh, tested and having clinical testing done. The fact of the matter is clinical testing, and this is true about all clinical, all, all testing, but uh, all uh, studies are, uh, can, be, can be manipulated. 
they're not necessarily the fact. There is, Mark Twain said there's three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. And so anytime you hear about a study that was done and 25% of people did this and 30% of people did that and it worked for 54% and it lowered blood cholesterol by 2%, you know you're dealing with a statistical analysis. And when you're dealing with a statistical analysis, you're dealing with one of the three kinds of lies. So, the, but unfortunately to the medical community, that's what counts. So my point is, is that as healthcare professionals, as health coaches, what we have to do to our clients is we have to empower them to understand that they can make their own decisions. And the way you empower them is with the, all, the source of all power, which is knowledge. Knowledge is the source of power. Knowledge is not power, by the way. You've heard that saying, perhaps, knowledge is power. Knowledge is not power, it's the source of power. And real power is the use, the right use of knowledge, which is called wisdom. Right. So if we can arm our clients with knowledge and allow them to utilize that knowledge themselves, they can be wise and take care of themselves. And that's, I, as, when I'm counseling somebody with longevity or even as a pharmacist, I always make sure they know that they're responsible, that I ain't no, I'm not a, a Mr. Health guru here. I'm telling you how, what's going on in your body. I'm showing you how you can take care of it, but you have to do the work. And we never want to get in a position as healthcare professionals where we think we're doing the work. The patient has to be empowered to do the work. And we never want to get into a position as healthcare coaches or healthcare professionals where we make it about us. It's not right. about us. It's about your patient and it's about your patient's body. And it's about his or her biochemistry. We want to empower them to be the superstars. And that not only is good advice as a healthcare coach or as a healthcare professional, that's good advice for business. Right. You always want to empower your patient or empower your client. You want to make sure that they leave an interaction with you feeling more powerful and more in control and more in charge of their lives. And then they'll start to value you. We, if we, when we give them power, they will come and they will value us plenty. If we become their mother or their father, then we've infantilized them. We've made them into an infant. We've made them into a child. That's not what we want to look for. Okay. Again, yeah. that's, a, that's a little long wind, but I hope I, I answered your question. About no, that. that was fantastic. And to your point, you know, we, I see people all the time, they're taking all these different medications and, um, you know, th there's been studies done on each one of those medications individually, and there's known side effects to all of them, but there's never been one study done on this one plus this one plus this one plus this, this one. one at the same yeah. time. Yeah. I mean, you're, do you're playing Russian roulette with that completely and it's a bad game of russian roulette because it's almost guaranteed you know here's another thing we talk about side effects and adverse reactions paul here's another thing when you take a prescription drug okay that your body sees that prescription drug chemical as the enemy in fact what the major side effects with prescription drugs the the big side effects of all prescription drugs if you look in the pdr you look in the in the uh, uh, patient handout that they're supposed to give you or that come with the drugs, the number one toxicity or side effect or adverse reaction with prescription drugs is nausea and vomiting. And the second side effect is diarrhea. Why? Because your body wants to get that stuff out of you quickly. That's the side effect is elimination out of your mouth or out the other end. That's the major side effect because to the body, a drug is a poison and Here's where it gets very important and, and where people don't understand or appreciate the significance of this is that when you take a drug, your body uses vitamin C to detoxify it. It uses copper to detoxify it. It uses magnesium to detoxify it. It uses essential fatty acids to repair from it. So the drugs you're taking not only cause side effects like and toxicities like nausea and vomiting and diarrhea or dizziness or insomnia or, or blood pressure problems, et cetera, they cause nutritional deficiencies that can ultimately lead to other problems. If you lose vitamin C, you can lead to heart problems or connective tissue disorders. If you lose the B complex, you can lose, um, end up with liver problems or mental health issues or heart problems. When you lose nutrients that should be used to, to uh, take care of the heart or the brain or any, uh, another part of the body, to the drugs that you're taking so that the body can detoxify the drugs, you run into a whole another range of side effects and toxicities, ultimately leading to early demise that don't even make it into the side effect profile, which is why, by the way, and this is really important for, for you guys who are health coaches or also doing longevity, the more prescription drugs somebody takes or the more regularly they take prescription drugs, the more they need the Beyond Tangy Tangerine. 
The more they need the de-stress, the more they need the ultimate EFAs. They say, oh no, I'm taking the medicine. Fine, you're taking the medicine. That, that's an extra reason why you want to be using your Beyond Tangy Tangerine to make sure you have enough nutrients to re replace the ones that are lost by the detoxification process. Drugs are the, the, the cell, the part of the body that, that does all the work is the cell, has only a very narrow menu with which it wants to interact. There's not a lot of things the cell wants to interact with. In fact, what we call the mighty 90 essential nutrients are largely the cell's menu. It's what the cell's eating from. A cell has been on planet Earth for three and a half billion years. And in that three and a half billion years, it's developed a taste for certain substances. Guess what? Ritalin or calcium channel blockers or even antibiotics are not on the cell's menu. And so all of that stuff has to be kicked out. It has to be eliminated. The in fact, the elimination process in the body is so significant that there's a phenomenon called first pass effect. First pass effect. The first pass effect is a biochemical phenomena where when you take a pill or you take a drug, it goes into your bloodstream, it circles around from your digestive system to your liver and immediately gets taken out of the liver. And then you have no more medicine left. And in order to, for you to have enough medicine to do the work, for, drug companies always recommend double the dose to account for what's called first pass effect. The body wants to eliminate that toxin so badly that it will reduce the dose to almost nothing. So the, when, you're, when doctors and, and medical professionals are dosing medicine, they have to account for first pass effect by giving you a much larger dose. Wow. You know, I never heard that, that before, but that is just amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. So when you walk into a doctor's office, you talk, tell him about your symptoms, his brain or their brain is already thinking, what drug, what drug, what drug can I give them to yes. suppress these, these, these symptoms? Now, when, when, when you uh, see a, a patient, a, a client, and they come to you and say, Ben, I have you know, this, 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 and this, talk about what awesome. your brain's going through. Awesome. I know awesome. you talk a lot awesome. about awesome. dirty blood and things. So yes, just go into yes, how yes. your brain processes that. Yes, yeah. Symptoms are like leaves on a tree and the body breaks down at the level of the roots and the soil. So when you're, first of all, by the way, I should say this. Doctors are not bad people. I have a lot of friends who are doctors and almost to a, a man or to a woman, they are beautiful human beings who want to help people, who want to make a difference. There's this, it's, it's kind of easy to rip on doctors, and I never do that. I rip on the model, the paradigm, right. the, the idea, the idea that we can treat ourselves pharmacologically or through surgeries or ablations and somehow be better off for it. That's number one. Number two, the idea of healing symptoms is not necessarily a bad idea if you're in pain. You want to take care of the symptoms. And this is how doctors are trained. My patient is suffering. I'm going to alleviate suffering. That's their training. Their training is not to get to the cause. Although I would say that getting to the cause would permanently eliminate suffering. They're not looking at it that way. They're looking at it like I'm here. This is my patient is having high blood, has high blood pressure. I need to take care of that. They're not looking at, that's not their job. That's our job. And that's really the patient's job is really to address it at the cause. So I don't want to make this about ripping on doctors, number one. And I don't want to make it uh, about marginalizing their relevance or their importance. Taking care of symptoms is sometimes important. Nonetheless, that's not how I operate. And the reason I don't operate like that is because while there's a zillion different symptoms, zillion with a Z, they all kind of start off in the same place. We all break down fundamentally in the same way. And I noticed this because I kept seeing patients with the same underlying problems. And I got, because of my job, because of my work as a, as a teacher and as a healthcare professional, and I was interacting with the public, I was doing public speaking, I got to see a lot of sick people. I got a big sample size of sick people. And so when you start to see a lot of data points, you start to see patterns emerge. And out of all these patients, I started to see these patterns emerge. In fact, what I noticed was there were three main places where the body broke down. And I, I, I started to study this and dive into it and I put it together and I realized that there is this triangle of disease that underlies all symptoms. There's this triad of bodily breakdown that everybody has. In fact, this triad uh, of uh, breakdown is so fundamental that it's not just sick people who have this breakdown, it's even apparently healthy people and it costs us years to our life. Even if we don't have a full-blown disease, we all break down in this generic fashion. Our digestive system breaks down first, 
our blood sugar system breaks down second, and then our adrenal glands, which are linked to the thyroid, uh, compensate for the problem. And that's the triangle of disease. And this is fundamental to all health challenges. So when I see somebody, I don't care if they're coming to me with high blood pressure, or they're coming to me with a, a weird skin problem, or cancer, God forbid, or heart disease, or dementia, or vertigo, or autoimmune problems, I always backtrack to the triangle of disease. Because underneath every single one of the 80,000 plus different diagnoses that you can get according to the World Health Organization, you will find this triad of bodily breakdown. No matter if it's a man, a woman, a child, an old person, a young person, if you have a long-standing chronic disease state, you will have these three points at the bottom of it. The good news is, is to address, the, to, to address the disease at the causal level, all you gotta do is address these three points. And the even better news is, is you don't have to be a doctor to do it. You don't have to be a healthcare professional even to do it. You can do it for yourself or you can do it with a little guidance. And the three parts are the digestive system, the blood sugar system, and the, I call it the adrenal thyroid complex, the link between the adrenal glands and the thyroid. So when I see somebody who comes in, the first thing I do, always work on the digestive system. I have them do a food diary. Uh, first, I'll ask them about food problems, but then I want them, I always want, you always want your patient involved. You don't want to be the guy or the gal who's just telling them what to do. You want them involved. So you say, you know what? I want you to do a food diary for two weeks. By the way, when you tell somebody to do a food diary for two weeks, one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to do it or they're not going to do it. And if they do it, you got yourself somebody you can work with. And if they don't do it, that's somebody you can sell a healthy start pack to or some Beyond Tangy Tangerine to, but it's not somebody that you really want to work with. So you're kind of weeding people out into the people who really want to get better from the people who are just either dancing around the edges or don't really want to do the work on some level. So have them do a food diary. First, I ask them questions and then I'll point things out to them. Uh, and then I'll have them uh, do a food diary. The second thing, by the way, working this way does and having them do a food diary is, is they start to notice things. Oh my God, every time I have corn, I bloat. Oh my God, every time I have milk, I break out. Oh my God, every time I have sugar, my hot flashes get worse. <laughs> they start to see things. They start to see the relationship that their life is having with their symptoms. They're starting to make connections. The medical model doesn't make those connections. The medical model says, I don't know. In fact, they have a term they call idiopathic. Have you ever heard of the term idiopathic? They say, oh my God, that's idiopathic pancreatitis or that's an idiopathic condition. Idiopathic means I'm an idiot. I got no idea what the heck you're talking about. That's what idiopathic means. The idio means unknown. Pathic means pathology. I have no idea what you're talking about. Nothing is idiopathic. There are people who might be, you know, not knowledgeable enough to see the connection, but not everything has a connection to something that you're doing. And so not only are you weeding people out when you have them do a food diary, not only are you letting them see uh, the relationship between their lifestyle and what they're doing, but third of all, they start to respect you because now you're helping them. Now you're making a difference in their life. Now they're starting to have aha experiences about what they can do and what they can't do. So you'll always start off with the digestive system and you always start off with the food diary. That's the first thing you do. Then once they start to see that, then I'm talking, thinking blood sugar. The blood sugar system is worthy of its own hour Zoom conversation or 40 minute Zoom conversation. So I'm not gonna get into that too much except to say that all of the leading causes of death, these are the leading causes of death, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, respiratory disease, uh, I think autoimmunity is fifth, and then stroke. And then, and then seventh is diabetes. Unfortunately, because of the relationship between these other six to diabetes, to blood sugar problems, Blood sugar problems encompass all of it. Cancer is a blood sugar problem. Heart disease is a blood sugar problem. Lung disease is a blood sugar problem. Autoimmunity is a blood sugar problem. Blood sugar is involved in all of these. <clears throat> so taking care of the blood sugar system is absolutely in, in vital. And the best way to do that is with food because nobody has a blood sugar problem unless they're eating. Eating a uh, blood sugar problem is an eating issue. You're eating the wrong food. And one of the most tragic uh, um, one of those uh, unfortunate of all our prescription strategies is using metformin and prescription drugs for what is really a pizza issue or a, a, a key lime pie issue or a snack food issue or a cracker issue or even an oatmeal issue. 
And to take somebody on, put somebody on metformin or any kind of prescription drug before you tell them to get off of the foods that spike their blood sugar is not only foolish and ignorant, it's a tragedy to me, the way I look at it, okay? So you ha have people controlling their blood sugar. Now, here's another very important point. There's diabetes is the name of the disease that's associated with messed up blood sugar. But you can have messed up blood sugar and not be a diabetic. So when people say to you, oh, well, I had my, they have all the markers of disease. And if you not now know that Ben is talking about, Ben said the, the triangle disease under these eyes, everything, you say, ma'am, I think your blood pressure, your eczema or your heart problem or whatever is related to sugar. They go, oh no, I had my sugar tested. It's normal. My doctor said it was normal. First of all, anytime, well, I won't say that, I, I scratch that. Um, the, 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 the diagnosis of diabetes is based on an arbitrary number so that your blood sugar is measured. And when your blood sugar reaches a critical threshold of 120 milligrams per deciliter, but let's just call it 120, you said to be a diabetic. But if it's 119.9999999, you're not a diabetic, you're perfectly fine. If it's 120, you're a diabetic, you get insurance like a diabetes person, you get medicine like a diabetes person, you get to wear a t-shirt that's from the American Diabetes Association, I'm a diabetic, and a little baseball hat that says, you get to run for the diabetes cure and all that stuff because you think you're diabetic, but at 119.999, you're not. But the problem is to the body's biochemistry, 119.99999 still means you're sick. It's, you may not have crossed the border to be a diabetic, but you're still gonna manifest the manifestations of what's called dis glycemia, i.e. messed, D-Y-S means messed up. Glycemia means blood sugar. So you can still be dysglycemic and be manifesting all of the symptomology of dysglycemia without being a diabetic. And then the third point is the adrenal thyroid complex. The adrenal glands are your stress glands. Let me just stop you real quick, Ben. So yes. just touch on some of the things that the blood sugar problem, the symptoms that produces. Everything. Inflammation mostly is the, the main sign and also something called glycation. The two, those are the two main things, but it all really boils down to inflammation. And that's a really good question. Um, and it'll come clear if, if I just, can, let me just continue sure. this and it'll become clear. That's okay. a good question though. The adrenal glands are your stress glands. Under conditions of stress, healing shuts down or healing is suppressed under conditions of long-term adrenal stress. So, and this is sequential, this triangle disease. It starts off when you're born basically, or sometimes even in the womb with digestive issues. If you're not breastfed or you're not breastfed long enough, or you're born with cesarean section, or you're eating the standard American diet, digestive problems are almost guaranteed. Then, because you get energy from digestion, your energy system is thrown off. That's the blood sugar system. So your blood sugar system, the breakdown in the blood sugar system, the dysglycemia issues follow the breakdown in the digestive system. And then once the, uh, the digestive system or the blood sugar system's messed up, the adrenal glands are picking up the slack of all that's up and down from the blood sugar, from the up and down blood sugar that's caused by 0.2 on the triangle of disease. The adrenal glands start kicking in and then you don't heal as well. You don't, you don't recover as well. You feel tired, adrenal fatigue issues. And then the adrenals connected to the thyroid. The thyroid controls everything. When the adrenal glands are activated long-term, the thyroid starts to slow down to compensate for it. That's called hypothyroidism and it's an epidemic. And because hypothyroidism is connected to the adrenal glands and the sugar and the digestive system, there's nothing a doctor can do for hypothyroidism, which is why anybody who has a thyroid problem will tell you that all they can do is be put on Synthroid. That's it, thyroid hormone. There's nothing they can do for the condition because they haven't seen the three points behind it. But now you do as a healthcare, as a health coach, now you can do it by addressing those three points. But here's where, to answer your question, where it really becomes a problem. The digestive system or the, the adrenal thyroid complex is also connected to the digestive system. So it's not really a triangle as much as it's a circle. And once your thyroid slows down, your digestive system slows down, that messes up the blood sugar system. That causes more adrenal stress, which causes more hypothyroidism, which slows down the digestive functioning, which messes up the blood sugar, which causes more adrenal stress, which further slows down the thyroid. And you get this downward spiral, this downward breakdown, which is where we are when we're 50 years old and we go, oh my God, I was just sitting on my couch watching TV and I got arthritis. I was minding my own business. I had not, has nothing to do with me. I was just sitting there, minding my own business, watching TV, and I got arthritis because we didn't see this downward spiral of breakdown that was occurring. We didn't connect this downward spiral of breakdown to our symptoms. 
So now you ask, you ask that question, what is the problem with the elevated blood sugar? The ele problem with the elevated blood sugar is basically because elevated blood sugar is a stressor on the system. Or I won't even say elevated blood sugar. We'll say out of control blood sugar. When the blood sugar goes up and then it goes down and then it goes up and then it goes down, I call it the high blood sugar, low blood sugar roller coaster, puts a stress on the system. That stress on the system is handled by the body's stress management system or stress management department. There's a biochemical process that is initiated in response to stress. It's like an airbag. You can think of stress like a car accident and you th can think of this biochemical process as an airbag. This biochemical process that pr protects us from stress and protects us from damage and protects us from all the bad things, including sugar, is called inflammation. So if you heard the term inflammation, you heard about how bad inflammation is, now you know, it's an airbag. Inflammation is the way the body protects itself. Elevated long-term, elevated blood sugar causes long-term inflammation. Now I'm being very, I'm not giving you a lot of details, I'm just giving you a bird's eye view here because how it happens is very fascinating, but from a bird's eye view, elevated blood sugar leads to an inflammatory response. Sugar is also very damaging itself. In fact, sugar causes things to burn. And some of the ladies in there out there who cook pastries or if you ever make candy and you ever had a piece of sugar like splash from the, from the, uh, from the uh, saucepan your, on your arm, it burns hotter than anything because sugar burns things. It can, it can hold on to a lot of energy so it gets hot. The sugar in your blood does the same thing. Not only does it, is it pro-inflammatory and induce inflammation because it's very stressful, it's so high energy, but it itself can cause burns. Those burns are called glycation. Glycation is a chemical burn that happens when sugar reacts with various proteins because your body is mostly protein. That means your collagen will glycate and your connective tissue will glycate. That uh, accelerates aging. That leads to disease, uh, uh, degenerative diseases like osteoporosis. Uh, heart, the heart contains lots of connective tissue. So elevated blood sugar, can the sugar itself can cause problems with the heart. The kidneys have tiny little blood vessels that are wrapped around like a kind of like uh, the way when, if you ever seen a, a ball of yarn, there are these tiny little blood vessels, microscopic blood vessels are wrapped around each other. Not really like in a wild way, like a ball of yarn, more orderly, but they're extremely tiny, they're microscopic, and sugar can burn those. And this is why elevated blood sugar is a leading cause of kidney disease. Um, there's also uh, blood vessels in the eyes, very tiny blood vessels, and elevated blood sugar glycation can also affect the tiny blood vessels in the eyes, and elevated blood sugar, chronically elevated blood sugar, is a leading cause of blindness. It's also a leading cause of neuropathy, that is pain. And let me tell you something, my mom is dealing with it now, and she's one of those people who had, uh, whose doctor says she has no blood sugar problems. You look at her, you can see she's got all kinds of blood sugar problems, but her tests are all normal, right? So she has neuropathy, and that poor woman, I don't know if anybody out there has it, but it is unreal, the agony. Her feet feel, her toes feel like they're on fire, at night especially. Now here's the funny thing. She, she says to me, I can't figure it out. It's only when I lay down. It's only when I might put my feet up. When I walk, I'm okay. Well, and her doctor can't figure out what it is either, by the way. Well, I'm like, hello, what's the difference? You don't get blood. You're not getting blood down there. You're not getting blood down there because the, tish, the, the, the blood vessels are all globbed up from glycation. You're not circulating. And this is the problem with, uh, this is a, a problem that's associated with elevated blood sugar. They call it peripheral neuropathy. It's also a leading cause Elevated blood sugar is also leading cause of amputations for the same reason, because it globs up the tiny blood vessels in your toes and, your, and in your fingers and your, in your extremities. So between the problems of inflammation, between the problems with elevated blood, associated with elevated blood sugar, that's bad enough. But now with diabetes, you also have a problem with excess insulin, because one of the major hallmark signs of elevated blood sugar is what's something called insulin resistance, where your cells stop listening to insulin. Insulin resistance has a whole nother spectrum of problems that are referred to generically as metabolic syndrome, which involve liver disease and high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease and obesity and dementia. And this is above and beyond the glycation and above and beyond the inflammation. So it's almost endless the various ways that these basic problems can show up symptomatically, everything from neuropathies to blindness to uh, sexual problems, to liver issues, to mental health issues, dementia, to amputations. It's, it's nearly endless to answer your question. The problems are associated with elevated blood sugar. Wow. You know, I've been, yeah, right? been following you for eight years and I 
I, you know, just putting that whole circle together, the cycle. And we right. call it the, 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 the three the triangle. Of it's, I call it the triangle of disease. It underlies all health issues, all chronic, long-term metabolic issues, biochemical issues. Love it. I, I'm, a, I'm a big flow chart guy, so I'm going to be making up a triangle okay, for you and That's sending awesome. it over to you. That's awesome. Now, um, let's, let's talk about how to fix that. So we got all these bad things happening. How yeah. do we get these, this triangle disease to reverse? Yeah. Well, I love the way you think. Problem, solution. Every problem has a solution. So Ben's got the answers. What's that? Yes. If there's a triangle of disease, there's a square of health. I call it the fourfold square of health. Square of health. Here we go. Square of health. How do you like that, Paul? <laughs> I, I'm real excited right now. Right, good. Uh, the square of health, like the fourfold square of health, is nutriate, respirate, move, and rest. And I, I don't know how much time we have because we can go into them all pretty deeply. Starting with, uh, let's start with uh, uh, respiration, which is, mo which is the breath. The easiest thing to do. The reason I want to start off with that is because if you want to give your client one quick thing to do, uh, to, to, is that me? No, it's not else. If you want to give your client one quick thing to do to feel better, have them breathe correctly. And there's a couple ways to do this, okay? When you breathe correctly, cortisol drops. When you breathe correctly, the adrenal, the third point in the triangle of disease, you break the circle when you breathe correctly because the adrenal gland stands down. The adrenal gland feels like everything's right in the world. And then when the adrenal gland starts to slow down, the thyroid starts to improve. When the thyroid starts to improve, your digestion improves. When your digestion improves with a little willpower because sugar has a little, there's some emotional issues associated with sugar that are important to recognize. But with a little willpower, it's easier to lay off of the sugar, which of course reduces the load on the adrenal glands, which improves thyroid functioning and, and you get a backward circle. Essentially, it all starts with breathing. And the good thing about breathing is, is you can get re results almost right away. And you could do it while you're waiting in line at the bank. You could do it while you're driving. You could do it while you're in the, at the movies. You could do it while you're sitting at the, on the couch, while you're on the bus, whatever. You could do it anywhere. You're portable with breathing. And breathing also, in addition to oxygenating the body and blowing out carbon dioxide, is very important for mental health too. So there's all kinds of benefits to breathing. It's really easy to do. In fact, if you want to show your client how smart you are, how effective your, your services can be, or how much you know about the body, tell them to take their blood pressure, hope if they have a blood pressure cuff, and uh, take a baseline level, and then sit on the couch for 10 minutes and practice slow, deep, rhythmic breathing. I call it SDR breathing, slow, deep, rhythmic. They're all important. And if you breathe incorrectly, you can make matters worse. So you want to make sure you're breathing slowly, deeply, and rhythmically. And then have them take their blood pressure again. It'll drop. They'll see it drop. And if you want to even be, give them a better, uh, a better demonstration, tell them to take their blood pressure. And then tell them to go sit in a bathtub with warm water. And just have a nice, relaxing, warm water bath or hot water bath, not too hot. And then take their blood pressure again. And again, the same thing will happen. The blood, the, because when you're sitting in the bathtub, you tend to breathe more, more easily. You, the adrenal glands slow down. So you can demonstrate to your client. This is the best antihypertensive there is, by the way. The best. No toxicity, no side effects. And I will have more respect for the medical model personally when they start writing prescriptions for slow, deep, rhythmic breathing on the couch. Or even better, I would say this as a joke, but I'm serious. If we really cared about health, if we really cared about health in this country, we wouldn't have Obamacare or ACA. We would have national hot tub insurance. There you go. Where every American gets a hot tub in their backyard to lower their blood pressure and have their adrenal glands stand down and break up the, uh, the triangle of the, the, uh, the uh, downward spiral of the triangle of disease. Now, that's quickly because they can do that right away. But then there's other things too in the fourfold square health. Movement is very important. When you move your body, you counteract the stagnation that's caused by the dirty blood. I didn't get into talking about dirty blood, but sugar causes dirty blood, food toxicity causes dirty blood, and uh, eventually cortisol, will, the stress hormone will compound the problem of dirty blood. So movement is a great way to counteract that. Movement improves the blood, uh, blood circulation. The breath will also improve blood circulation and when you blood circulates more effectively it generates electrical charges more effectively our blood our battery our body is driven by a battery that is supercharged by the movement of the blood that's called the zeta potential the zeta potential is the is the uh, uh, the mathematical designation for the energy that's created by circulation of fluids actually of fluids and particles it's called fluid dynamics or in the blood they call it hemodynamics 
and this generate this zeta potential that's generated from the hemodynamic action of the fluid and the of the solid particles in the blood and the fluids is gives you energy to do things. So ironically, the more tired you are, the more you need to move your body. The more lethargic you are, the more imperative it is to move your body if you really want to have energy because you're going to be generating electrical charges that will facilitate energy in the body. And then third point on the, on the square of health is rest. We live in a culture where we don't like to rest. We live in a culture where we always think we have to do something. It's not even just our culture. The, the mathematician Blaise Pascal in the 1600s said all of, man prob all of man's problems, I'm paraphrasing here, all of man's problems can be reduced to his inability to sit in a room alone by himself. Mm -hmm. And this is because we as a culture don't like to, we don't like to sit still. And I, I'll tell you why we don't like to sit still, because when we lo don't like to sit still, all that crap in our brains becomes louder and louder and louder. That's why people have insomnia. That's why people can't meditate. It's because we have this voice in our head and we're always constantly trying to ignore it or these feelings that we're trying to ignore. So learning to sit still and rest, and I cannot begin to express to you how powerful a meditation practice can be. It doesn't have to be anything Buddhist or religious or anything like that. It could just be purely physical and functional. If you want to make it spiritual, that's great. It's a wonderful way to tap into your spirituality. But even just from a physical standpoint, meditation as the third point on the, on the square of health, that is the rest point on the square of health, is incredibly powerful medicine. And then fourth, of course, is nutrition. And there's different kinds of nutrition, or I should say different. There's two types of nutrition. There's macro and there's micro. Macronutrition means big nutrients, protein, fats, carbohydrates. You might throw in fiber and water into that. Uh, but basically macronutrients, your protein, fats, and uh, carbohydrates need to, number one, be understood because we don't understand fats. And by the way, I do a radio program, for those of you who don't know, every day called The Bright Side. And we've been talking about fats now for two months, how critical understanding of essential fatty acids and fatty vitamins and fatty uh, phytonutrients, plant nutrients are. So making sure you understand how to work with your fats, your protein, and your carbohydrates, as well as fiber and water is important. And then the mighty 90 essential nutrients, the micronutrients, the nutrients you need micrograms or milligrams of, and those are the vitamins, the minerals, and uh, two essential fatty acids. And you can also probably throw in essential amino acids there. And that's where we come in. That's where longevity comes in. Longevity provides the micronutrients, the essential nutrients, the menu from which a cell likes to eat. And that's what, that's what this was Dr. Wallet's most brilliant insight. He has so many brilliant insights, but one of his most brilliant insights was this idea that deficiency diseases can be corrected with micronutrients. And I'll just tell you this real quick. Do we, how much time do we have, Paul? Hey, listen, we go, you know, we got another five, 10 minutes, whatever you need. Okay. All right, real quick. So if people ever ask you about how vitamins work or how uh, essential, the mighty 90 essential nutrients work, here's how they work. I was on, I don't know if you guys saw me on do uh, beyond belief. George Norrie has a TV show on Gaia and I was doing beyond belief. And we were talking at the very end. He says to me, you know, he's, we were talking about various health topics. At the end, he says to me, Ben, what is health? And it kind of floored me for a second because I, I kind of, I knew about the little things, but I didn't really know. I, I, I wasn't expecting a question like that. So I had to think and all of a sudden I realized what health was specifically. Health comes from the word whole. Whole equals health. Fragmentation equals disease. When we're sick, that triangle of disease that we talked about, which, what's really happening with this inflammatory process that ensues after the triangle of disease has been circling around for a long time, is we get little pockets that are separated from the rest of the body. These little pockets can be thought of almost like little pockets of death and little pockets of disease. And instead of being one whole unified force where the energy can flow through us in a uniform uh, distributed kind of way, it short circuits. It can't flow through everything. We're not whole. We're fragmented. What vitamins do and minerals do and amino acids and, and fatty acids do is they act like bridges that connect the, the flow of electricity from point A to point B. So that instead of electricity going boom and then bumping and then stopping and then having to start somewhere else, the nutrients, they're essential, you have to have them, they sit in like a pontoon bridge and allow the electrical energy to flow with greater facility. They turn us from fragmented beings into whole beings from an electromagnetic perspective. Without the mighty 90 essential nutrients, we become fragmented and the manifestation, the physical manifestation of this fragmentation is what we call disease, out of ease. So awesome, so awesome. So. Ben, talk to us a little bit more. Uh, if you get, and we got a couple more minutes here about this dirty blood. Like, what makes up the dirty blood? It's yeah, toxins, that's a great question. People always 
people always say, what, how do I clean my blood? That sounds hideous, doesn't it? Dirty blood. And literally, it's dirty blood. It's got fibers, protein fibers, and strands, and, the, and pus, P-U-S, pus. Little you know, microscopic versions of pus, not the kind that comes out of a zip, but constituently, it's the same stuff. And you can imagine this in your bloodstream. Fibers and pus and particles of food that you couldn't process correctly, peptides, things that the blood is a sacred space. In the Bible, it says the life of the body is in the blood. The blood has to be pristine. It has to be clean. So over time, as this dirty blood, uh, as this blood, as the blood becomes dirtier, it leads to problems with the zeta potential. It leads to problems with nutritional deficiency. It leads to problems with oxygenation. It leads to problems with detoxification. The question becomes, how do you clean the blood of the food particles, of the fibers, and, and of the pus, of the infectious material? Well, in order to understand that, we got to figure out how is, how is stuff getting into the blood in the first place? There's only really two ways things get into the blood. What are the two ways things get into the blood? Through the skin. Yeah, also technically through the nose, but there's a lot of protection there. The mouth. Now, most people are not IV drug users. Most of our clients aren't injecting things in through the skin, although vaccines will do all the stuff we're talking about here. Uh, hang on a second here. Vaccines can do it. So even if you're not an IV drug user, some of us, a lot of us actually, are sticking things into our blood. But for the most part, the main entrance of toxicity into the bloodstream is through food. And given the fact that so much, many of us are dealing with this triangle of disease issue with, where it begins at the, with the digestive system, which begins in utero for some people, at birth for other people, and certainly for most people at childhood. And on top of that, 99% of the food that's in the supermarket didn't exist 100 years ago. You know, your, your body has no idea what to do with that. It makes perfect sense that the, the uh, blood would become dirty from the stuff that we're eating. And that's indeed the main source of dirty blood. So what do you do? Well, obviously the first thing you can do is not eat foods that can, are gonna contaminate the blood. Second thing you do is patch up the gut, the, the intestine. When I say the gut, I mean the intestine. The small intestine is where food entered, where McDonald's hamburgers and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and steaks and whatever we're eating become our bloodstream. Literally at the juncture of the intestine, this is why most of the immune system is in the intestine. You got food, if, if the intestine is a hose, Test is like a circle, like a hose. Food comes in, and on the other side of that hose is us. The intestine isn't even us. The ancient Greeks thought the intestine was another animal that lived inside us. So it, things are not us until they cross the wall. The problem is well, there's a health challenge that many, if not most people who are sick are dealing with, where the intestine is breaking down, and instead of the nutrients getting into the bloodstream carefully in a tightly regulated fashion, they're flooding into the bloodstream through what's called leaky gut, intestinal permeability. And that's the main source of toxicity. So in addition to eliminating foods that cause problems and can lead to inflammatory issues at the level of the gut, patching up the gut is very important. And there's lots of ways to do that. The microbiome, the bacteria are very important. I'm very happy to see that Longevity has two really interesting new products. You probably know all about this, Paul. Uh, one is called Ultimate Microbiome. And then the other, as, and I was talking to Rebecca, uh, before I went on George Norrie, thank you for pointing this out, Rebecca, is the Daily Digest, which is becoming fast becoming one of my new favorite products. Also, the I-26 is also important for, for digestive health. And of course, the nightly essence is also important. So patching up the gut by taking care of the intestine and building the intestinal lining is the second thing that you want to do to keep the blood clean. And then there's a third thing that you can do to keep the blood clean, and that's called chelation. Chelation is a magnetic, uh, a, a magnetic process where uh, toxins are sucked out of the blood, key, are chelated out of the blood magnetically. This is one of the uh, hidden secret benefits of plant-derived minerals. They're chelating agents. We don't even talk about this. I know I'm sure Dr. Wog knows about it, but he doesn't even mention it. There's so many things to mention. He doesn't even mention that one. Chelating the blood with plant-derived minerals. I shouldn't say, I haven't heard him mention it. He probably has mentioned it. Chelating, uh, chelating uh, the blood with plant-derived minerals. Vitamin C from the Beyond Tangy Tangerine also has a chelating effect. And acetylcysteine from the uh, liver cleanse has a chelating effect. And then the fourth way to clean the blood is with enzymes, especially natokinase, which is in the uh, nightly essence, and uh, the uh, proteases, the protein enzymes that are in the, uh, uh, that are in the ultimate enzymes. So good. So good. So good. So good. And this is, uh, you know, our mission in life is to help people elevate their health, to get out of this, this triangle of disease 
yes. and um, and into the uh, circle of health here. So we really square of health. So where get your shapes right? Square of health. I get square my my shapes health. correctly here. Yes. <laughs> Well, Ben, that was absolutely phenomenal. We really appreciate your time for coming on here. Um, we got to have you back on to have talk about this blood sugar alone. I, I was fascinated by what you were saying yeah. about that. As you know, I'm, I'm really into keto. We have a, a ton of keto coaches on here. Keto is awesome. We, yeah, where we really focus on controlling people's blood sugar and uh, not only helping them lose weight, but there's so many... I'm going to call them side effects to keto and getting your blood sugar under control. As you pointed out today, um, it's a huge, huge problem. Thank you. Thank you for getting it. Thank you for the work you're doing and, and all the stuff you're doing, and you know, not only for longevity people, but just to make the world a better place, Paul. Well, thank you for that. And thank you, Ben, for being the leader that you are and uh, the health advocate. We love you and uh, really appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Bye, okay, everyone. everybody, let's have, uh, I'm going to unmute the lines and have everyone say goodbye to Ben. Thank Ben. Thank, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, ben. Thank you, ben. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Bye. That was awesome. Brilliant, brilliant. I can't Thank think of anything else. Brilliant. Awesome. Have a great day, everybody. We'll get this recording up. Thanks, Ben. Right. That was Looking great lecture. Looking forward to the next you. installment. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you too. Okay. Bye for now.